Hey everybody, welcome back to another live Q&A uh, and video analysis. So what we're going to be talking about is... I lost the video, I had it up here. But it's the terminal marker versus the continuation marker. Or continuation marker versus the terminal marker. Okay, so in the video, it's a pretty quick, short, straightforward video. What you wanna keep in mind when you're using these two different markers, and as you do something for a long time, you start to learn ways in which it's easier to explain and transfer that information over to somebody else. And what I've learned is telling people more about what our words predict to our dogs makes it much easier to understand the word and know how to use it. So we have the continuation marker and the terminal marker. In the beginning, I talk about the continuation marker, letting the dog know that they are correct, but they have to come to us to get the reward. Now, as I just mentioned, it's much easier to think about what the word predicts. And if we simplify it, it's going to make the process even that much easier. A continuation marker, all it does is it predicts a reward. That is it. In my videos, I use the word yes. So when I tell my dogs yes, I'm letting them know that they're going to get a reward. That's it. Now, the primary reinforcers, because our markers are the condition reinforcers, the primary reinforcers is what the condition reinforcer predicts. Primary food, toy, or affection. Now, when I'm working with dogs, I reserve my markers as a predictor for food or toys. Since we pet our dogs all the time, I don't like to use a marker as a predictor for petting. I prefer it to predict either a piece of food or a toy. And then in the video I say terminal marker lets a dog know they're correct, they're done with the exercise, and they can come and get the reward. Again, let's simplify it a little bit more. All the terminal marker means is they're going to receive a reward and they are released from the position. Now, if our dog is not in a commanded stay position, then they're not being released from anything. So we don't really have to worry about it. If we look at the step-by-step -step process that I teach in my videos and in my manual, number one, remember, is that engagement training. This is where we are teaching our dogs the different markers that we're going to be using while we're training them. It's a very simple process. We have the dogs look at us. Once they look at us, we mark that behavior, letting them know that looking at us is a good thing. And then we follow it up with the delivery of the reward. And I just want to say hi back to everyone who said hi so far. Sorry, I'm trying to get through the information so I can go right to the Q&A portion because I know that's what most people really care about. They like that Q&A portion and being able to have their questions answered. Okay, excellent. Um, so again, going back to those two different markers. Now, step one, we get them conditioned to the markers. Step two is where we start using our technique of luring in order to get our dogs to do the behaviors we're trying to teach them. And if you know how to handle food correctly, I do have an episode on this. I think it's called power steering, something like that. But it's a technique where the way in which you handle the food makes it much easier to teach our dogs different behaviors. If you watch the trick video that I just posted, Maureen Cuccinella is is doing an exercise where she has her dog going around her in the heel position walking backwards and if you notice the way she's holding the food and the way she's turning her hand is really making the uh it's helping determine the direction of the dog's body where the head goes the body follows and with that second step when we're first teaching our dog sit down, come, heel, center, spin, climb, off. All these different behaviors, we're not saying a command. Now that's something that people always ask about. They say, well, shouldn't I start naming the behavior right away? No, and just like I talked about in the last live video that we did, when I was doing stay in trains with different dogs, I always had the adjustment period where I wanted to make sure the dog was adjusted and comfortable in their new environment before I started asking them for a bunch of different commands and trying to do obedience with them. Because if we start training our dogs when they're uncomfortable or when they're anxious, when they're not in the right mindset, then they're gonna associate that feeling with the training. So we always wanna make sure they're in the best possible mood in order to transfer that over to the way they feel about the training. 
when we first start shaping different behaviors, we want our dogs to be able to focus on that physical cue. Just like humans, dogs cannot multitask. They focus on one thing at a time. And I know a lot of people think that they can multitask, but the science has proven that we do not multitask, we task switch. We switch back and forth from different things if we're trying to multitask and we'll never do it as good as focusing on one specific thing that we're trying to accomplish. So dogs cannot multitask. So we get them to understand that concept of following the lure. Now there's a few things that makes this valuable. By not adding the commands, we don't have to worry about the stay. Now, as many of you know, I like to teach the implied stay, meaning when we tell our dogs to go into a commanded position, they are in a stay. There are three ways to maintain the stay. There are three ways to release a dog from a stay. So if I tell a dog to sit and they sit down, if I use the continuation marker, they are in a sit stay. If I tell a dog to sit and they sit down and I provide them with verbal praise, good boy, good girl, nice job, they are in a sit stay. If I tell a dog to sit and they sit and I say nothing, they are in a sit stay. The three ways we, we release them from the stay is we can either use our terminal marker, again, release and reward. We can give them a new command or we can use a release word. Now you might be asking yourself, what's the difference between a release word and a terminal marker? The difference is the release word, even though when you release a dog, so I use the word break, and if you watch my videos, you've probably seen me release a dog with the word break and then give them a piece of food. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's the same thing. You release the dog, you gave them a piece of food. The difference is the release word only guarantees a release. You can reward them after you use a release word, but unlike the terminal marker, if you use the terminal marker, just like if you use the continuation marker, we pay our dogs. That is what makes these words so valuable and so powerful. Going back to the video, I use the example where the dog is 10 feet away. Actually, sorry, I'm jumping around. That's my ADD kicking in. So the second step, we're just luring our dogs into the different positions. So since we're luring dogs into different positions, if I lure the dog into the sit, the moment the dog's butt hits the ground, I mark it and then I give the dog a reward. In that situation, can you use the continuation marker or the terminal marker? And if you said yes, you are correct. It doesn't matter which marker you use during step two of my training, shaping the behaviors using a physical lure or physical cue, because we haven't commanded the dog to go into a position. So therefore, there is no stay. So if we say our continuation marker doesn't make it a stay, and if we say a terminal marker, well, the dog's gonna be rewarded and they're released, but they're not being released from anything. So it really doesn't matter. During step two, you can use a continuation marker or the terminal marker. Now, what I do recommend is when we are training our dogs, and this is something I talked about in the video that we're discussing right now, depending on the type of dog we're working with will depend on which marker you should be using more often than the other. If you're working on a dog that really doesn't have that much motivation or maybe just an average level motivation dog, then we can use a terminal marker. This is going to help increase the motivation. It's gonna increase the speed. Remember, speed is based on motivation and it's gonna make the training more fun and engaging, which will make the dog become a little bit more excited and amped up during each training session, increasing that energy and desire to learn and train with you. If you have a dog that's overly excited, that really is constantly moving, a good example is my dog, Charlie, then it's better to use the continuation marker just to kind of slow them down a little bit so they're not going to be as excited. Now, step three is when we start teaching our dog leash pressure. During step three, same thing. It doesn't matter really if we use continuation marker or our terminal marker because the dog is not in a commanded position so we don't have to worry about releasing them from anything. Once we get to step four and we start teaching our dogs the commands, now it matters. Now, when I first start teaching a dog commands, I do like to use the terminal marker almost exclusively in the very beginning. And the main reason why is because we don't wanna have to worry about the stay. If I'm doing sit and I cue the dog into the sit, the dog sits and I use the terminal marker, for me, it's the word free, then the dog can jump up and I can reward the dog and we can go right to the other exercise. So it does a couple things. One, it increases the motivation as we already talked about. Two, 
we don't have to worry about the stay, and three, it helps us get through way more repetitions of different behaviors during a short training session. So we have a five to 10 minute training session, and we're able to do so many different repetitions in that amount of time when we're using the terminal marker. Sit, free, reward. Down, free, reward. Heal, free, reward. And we're not worried about the stay at this point. And since we have the dog engaged with us because of step one, we're not worried about the dog losing focus, getting distracted and going somewhere else or picking up something off the ground. We have that engagement. If you are worried about that, keep a leash on so you can use that leash pressure cue that we taught our dogs. Okay, so now going back to the video, I talk about the example where the dog's 10 feet away. If they sit, if I tell a dog to sit, that's far away, or if you tell a dog to sit, that's far away, and the dog sits, and you use the continuation marker, if you're doing the implied stay, then you would have to walk over and reward your dog. You don't have to run to your dog to get the reward, because remember, our dogs, once they're conditioned to the marker, we have as long as it takes us to get the reward to the dog without losing the connection as long as the dog maintains focus. So as long as the dog is focused on us and they're maintaining that attention, we have as long as it takes. And if you have your dogs conditioned any sort of sound, it doesn't even really have to be a marker. If you do something with your dogs like, who's hungry, are you ready for dinner, or you wanna go outside? And what does the dog do? They get really excited, they get happy because they know what that predicts. It doesn't mean once you say, do you wanna go outside, you have to run them outside the front door, or they're gonna forget what happened. Remember, our dogs are not goldfish. So once you mark the behavior, you walk to them and you give the dog the reward. If you use the terminal marker, then your dog can jump up and your dog can do a couple things. They can come to you to get the reward if you have the reward on your person, or you can have a reward off to the side where the dog can get the reward and then come back to you. There's different ways of doing it. Now, some people will use different markers for different types of terminal markers, we can say. So they have a terminal marker that lets a dog know to come to them to get the reward. They have a terminal marker that lets their dog know to go and get the reward from somewhere else. I'll just use the same word in that situation. Then we talk about uh, the stay. And I talk a little bit about making fun of the hand signal where people walk away and they're like, stay, stay. Some people like to use the word stay and that is completely okay. Stay will not, saying stay will not have a negative impact on the training. But what I recommend is we always wanna make sure that our words do predict something. So what I've had success with when adding the stay command is showing the dog that once I say stay, what do we want it to mean? Well, we want the dog to stay there, but it also often means we're walking away and that's a good way to start teaching it in the very beginning. So we go stay and then we walk away if the dog breaks. Depending on the stage of the training, we can use the marker that predicts negative reinforcement, the leash pressure, that's my word wrong, or we can use our marker that predicts positive punishment, implement a correction, recommand, place a dog in the commanded position depending on where the dog is in the training. But you can say stay again if you want, it will not have a negative impact on the training. Sorry, my computer screen just shut off. Okay. Um, let's see, when to use each marker, excited dog, increasing the speed. We hit all those bullet points already. Uh, talking about speed, motivation, the more motivated the dog is, the faster they're going to move. I do have a video specifically on increasing your dog's speed. I use the fetch example in the video. Have you ever seen a dog play fetch and walk to get the ball? Maybe if the dog doesn't care to play fetch and they're being forced to do it, but if the dog enjoys playing fetch, they run at it. So again, motivation will increase our dog's speed. And then, yeah, that's pretty much it. So that's the video, we covered everything. I talked obviously in way more detail since it's a five minute video, but now we're gonna go to questions that I'm gonna answer. I'm gonna start with my members questions and then I'm gonna jump to the first few questions that were asked within this live video. So the first question is, my once dog reactive German Shepherd uh, is used to my friend's dog, seven year old, somewhat submissive female. They've walked together many times on leash and sometimes she's off leash walking around while he's on leash. The last time we met, I put him in a sit and was petting her, hello. They were saying hello nose to nose when suddenly he growled and lunged at her. Not sure if he was feeding off my energy, but is there any reason why he would do this other than being an a-hole? I corrected him. Okay, any advice? When we're working with a dog that used to be reactive, even if they've been around other dogs, it's always good to be watching the body language. So something that 
I recommend to avoid doing is allowing dogs to say hello muzzle to muzzle. That can sometimes, even with the dogs that are not reactive or aggressive towards other dogs, just being in that position, that posture, can often trigger a dog fight. And you know what I'm talking about, you've seen it before, if you've gone to dog parks or you've been around a bunch of dogs that are together, they get muzzle to muzzle and that triggers a dog fight. Or they get muzzle to muzzle and then one brings their head over the back of the other dog's shoulder blades. That will also often trigger an aggressive reaction and depending on whether or not the other dog retaliates, then it could turn into a dog fight, which we definitely don't want. So I would try to avoid allowing the dogs to go muzzle to muzzle. And then the second thing is, well, actually what, sh what you did was correct. So you corrected him. That's what I would have done. I would have corrected him for doing that behavior, letting him know that's not okay. We don't know exactly why dogs do certain things. We can have an idea based on the dog's body language. I mean, it's very easy to tell if a dog is happy and wants to be playful. Everybody knows the low bow, the butt up in the air, the tail wagging. There are things that are very easy to read, but we don't necessarily know the dog was angry because of this. The dog was fearful because of this. The dog was anxious because of this. We don't always know the because, but we can often read their body language and figure out what's going to be the best course of action to prevent something bad from happening or of course encouraging the dog to learn. So I think the correction was the right way to go. That's what I would have done. I would have corrected the dog and then next time try to make sure that I'm preventing any sort of possible behavior that could lead up to that sort of incident that we're dealing with. The next one is I'm interested in becoming a professional dog trainer and I looked into schools but I'm not in the U.S. I've seen your videos on the Tom Rose School, Kennelwood Academy, etc. Are there any such programs in Europe that you'd recommend? Or you do, do you have any other tips on how to go about for someone who's not in the U.S.? If you're not in the U.S., of course, I don't know what other sort of dog trainer schools there are. But Europe, if you're in Europe, um, there are a lot of dog training clubs and competitions that take place in Europe. Uh, Schutzen, you know, that's that was started in Germany. You have French Ring, you have all these different sports, Mondio Ring, PSA, that started in the United States. But you could probably find what my biggest recommendation would be if you cannot find a school or if you can find somebody to mentor under, then look for dog training clubs. Dog training clubs is a great way to go. You can find a protection club. You can find uh, strictly an obedience club. And what's really nice about dog training clubs, often the members in the club are professional dog trainers. And since you're working together as a team, the club trains together and they compete together, they're more than happy to teach you what they know, guide you and help you the best way they possibly can. So Going to a club, hands down, one of the best ways to learn. Of course, you can learn online. You have my videos or some other really good dog trainer videos out there. You have Learberg Online University, which is great. Michael Ellis has a bunch of great videos online. So learning online and then putting in the time and practicing. Of course, you're not going to be a pro by just training your own dog, but going and volunteering at a local rescue, a local shelter, those are also really great ways to learn and work with multiple dogs with different personalities personalities and behavioral and training issues that is going to increase your understanding and your frame of reference so you can handle taking on clients and training them at a level that you would consider that that you would be happy with if someone was to train your dog for you so reaching up to that exceptional level so that would be my recommendation my puppy doesn't like to go downstairs she clearly is happy to go outside yet when I go to pick her up, she scoots away, goes across the room, sits, and makes me come to her side of the room to fetch her. It could be she, that she wiggled out of my grasp while on the stair glide and broke her paw. She may be associating the stair glide to the injury. Any su suggestion? Yes, dogs can associate a bad experience to something that didn't even specifically cause the issue. So if your dog did fall off of the stair glide and hurt her paw or injured her paw, then yes, that could be creating fear. I talk about this often when dealing with fear-based uh fear-based behaviors or issues. And if you're watching this, you probably already know what I'm gonna say, counter conditioning and desensitization. With something like this, I would also work on leash pressure. I wanna make sure with leash pressure. So what is the big difference between using positive reinforcement and using leash pressure? Well, positive reinforcement, 
let me rephrase that. What's the difference between using just positive reinforcement in comparison to using negative reinforcement with positive reinforcement? Well, positive reinforcement is limited by how much the dog wants the reward that we're offering. Using the combination of negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement reduces the dog's option of choice. It says, doesn't matter whether or not you want to do this behavior, you have to comply. Now, I'm still going to behave, I'm still going to reward you, but you have to do this behavior. So what I'll do with something like that, first, I'm going to, I'm going to expose the dog to this. I'm not going to avoid it and I'm not going to wait till I'm just getting ready to take the dog down the stairs when I don't have a leash or collar or any way to reinforce expectations. Remember, when we want our dogs to act and perform a certain way in a specific situation, we need to rehearse that with our dogs and treat it as a training process for anything we want our dogs to do successfully well. So with something like that, I might start working on a recall upstairs, getting closer and closer to the stairs, but not necessarily to the stairs right away. We have to read our dog and make sure we're not overwhelming the dog during the training process. But then if you do give a command, let's say you're doing a recall command and you're a little closer to the stairs and she doesn't want to come over, use the leash pressure, cue the dog. Now you might walk towards her a little bit, but you still want to make sure you accomplish that recall command. So she doesn't become situational and think, okay, in this situation, I don't have to listen to you. It's been proven multiple times. So when you call me, I'm going to scoop back in the corner, make you come pick me up. So have it ready, put the dog in the situation, then have the tools to go through that training process correctly. What I would also do is I would start having the dog go down the stairs starting on the bottom step. So I would go to the bottom, I'd put the dog on the very bottom step and I would call her off that step. Then I would go to the second, I would do the same thing, third, fourth, sixth, seventh, all the way until I'm having the dog go down from the very top of the stairs. That's going to help her become more comfortable with it as well and starting at the bottom is going to make the process seem much smoother. You're gonna be surprised at how quickly your dog will become comfortable going down the stairs when you start on the bottom step and gradually work your way up. And so what I mean is you're placing your dog on one step, cueing them down, placing them on the second, cueing her down, placing her on the third, cueing her down. If she's comfortable to walk up, do that as well. But start at the bottom, work your way up and back down. Is it okay to let other people command tricks that I've taught my dog? They often have bad timing, but they do enjoy commanding the tricks and I see how they feel when the dog does something that they ask for. Will this delay my conditioning? There's different, uh, okay, so there are different people that think differently about this. When I was first learning how to train dogs, I was told don't let anyone give your dog any commands. If you leave for a weekend and somebody is watching your dog and they're giving your dog all sorts of commands and they're not reinforcing it, then the dog is going to ignore you once you get back because they've, in a sense, reconditioned the dog to not obey or not listen to commands and it just undoes all your training. From my experience, it really does depend on the dog and how well they are generalized to the training, that's one. Or if you've only trained your dog and your dog knows that you have certain rules and expectations, what they might do in the beginning, if they've been getting commands from other people and their timing's not correct and it's not reinforcing the way that you would like them to reinforce these behaviors, then it could slow it down a little bit. I haven't seen it to a point where it's 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 so dramatic that it's almost like reversing the training. But yeah, it can delay it a little bit. It can delay it a little bit, but I don't think it's going to be so bad that it ruins the training. And if you notice that it is starting to make your dog slow down in the training process, then give it a break for a little while. Don't have other people work with your dog or give them tricks. And then when you feel like your dog is performing better and, and the timing's really nice, usually what I'll do if I'm having somebody give my dog a couple commands, if they want to ask her to go into heel or they want to have the dog do a spin or something goofy, I'll give them some treats. I'll let I'll have them show the dog like that they have the treats because why is a dog going to do a behavior for somebody that's not their owner? Well, to get access to a reward. Of course, that's what we want our dogs to do for us, but we also want our dogs to do commands even when they don't have access to a reward right away. So once they show the dog that they have the reward, then I have them give the dog the command. Often I will do it first and I will tell them pay attention to the way that I'm giving my dog the command. Pay attention to the rise and inflection of my voice. The way I say sit, sit, down, 
heel, I make it a very specific noise so it's clear and easy for the dog to understand. If somebody tries to give my dog a command and they're not coming close to the way I say it, then often the dog might do a different behavior. So that's another part. And then when your dog does the behavior, you can mark it and they can give the dog the reward. So you could tell them, once I say this word, whatever your marker is, then go ahead and give my dog the reward. So they give the command, the dog does the behavior, you mark the behavior, they give the dog the reward. And that's going to reduce any of the likelihood of it slowing down or delaying your training. All right, my dog is aggressive to my other dog, and when he look, when he's looking at her, I will say his name, and when he looks at me, I mark and reward. And other times, when he's looking at her, I will just mark, and he will look at me. So, is it possible that I could be marking the wrong thing, since I don't know what he's thinking? All right, so the exercise that you're doing is a common exercise that is used for dogs that might be slightly reactive to other dogs while on a walk. So you're walking your dog, the dog looks at another dog, you get your dog's attention, your dog looks at you, you mark that behavior and reward. So you mark your dog looking at you. What that does is it teaches the dog, okay, anytime we're on a walk, find another dog, like identify the other dog, look for another dog. Once you spot another, another dog, look at me and I will pay you for that. So it doesn't teach the dogs not to look at other dogs, but what it does do is it teaches them to look for other dogs, identify them, then look at the handler in order to get a payment, in order to get a reward. And it does start to create a positive association. This is a little bit different because it's your own two dogs. So when he's looking at her and you say his name, he could start to learn that looking at her is going to make you say his name, which is going to make him look at you and you're gonna reward him. So very similar to the walk. You definitely don't want to be marking with a continuation or terminal marker while he's looking at the other dog because dogs are thinking about what they're looking at. And if you're doing that, then you are rewarding him for looking at her. So just figure out what behaviors you want him to perform when he's around your other dog and start marking those behaviors. If looking at her ends up causing other issues, which often can happen. The dog stares at the other dog and then eventually that might turn into a dog fight or the dog runs after the other dog barking in an aggressive manner. If you start to notice certain behaviors are a predictor of other behaviors you don't like, then redirect it to something different. So what I would do when he starts to look at her, I would, be, I would use that as my cue to give him the climb command. So the moment he does that, I'd go climb and I'd take him and put him on the climb platform or I would do something else to redirect that, that behavior. So I wouldn't allow him to just stare because that can often cause issues. But yeah, you could be correct. You could be actually rewarding him for doing a behavior you don't like in that situation. So reward the behavior that you do like. And then if he does do something that you don't like, I would correct. I would correct the behavior, let him know that that's not an okay behavior. Okay, so now we're gonna jump to, that was all the member questions that we had. So now I'm gonna jump in and see what questions we have so far. So first one, how best to address excessive barking, barking at vacuum, people walking by, watermelons, et cetera. We, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't wanna discourage her protective nature through these corrections. Okay, so this is something I talked about last time. First, you want to know why your dog is barking. So if we're thinking about a vacuum, what I do with dogs that are uncomfortable with the vacuums or uh, people walking by or watermelons, all these different things is telling me more likely than not that your dog is unsure of what these things are. And as a response to it, she starts to bark. I think it's a she. Yeah, she. Uh, discourage her protective nature through these corrections or protective nature, sorry. More often, more likely than not, it's not protective. It's lack of confidence. It's probably some anxiety associated with that. So I would go back to counter conditioning and desensitization with vacuums. What I like to do with dogs with vacuums is I take the part, I take the vacuum apart as much as I possibly can. I introduce a piece to the dog, I mark and reward. I put that piece away, I get the next piece, mark and reward. I get the dog comfortable with each piece separately. And then I bring one piece and then I bring another piece and I take one away, I bring another one. So I start rotating them through. So now there's two pieces and then three pieces, four, five, six, seven, eventually until I have all the pieces. Then I start putting it together, I reward the dog, put the next piece together, reward the dog, put the next piece together, reward the dog until the vacuum is 
completely assembled. Then I turn on the vacuum, turn it off, reward the dog. Turn on the vacuum, turn it off, reward the dog. I might move the vacuum without turning it on, mark and reward. Then I'll turn it on, move, turn it off, mark and reward. So you're getting your dog comfortable and giving your dog an opportunity in a sense to learn what the vacuum is. So that's going to be part of that desensitization and counter conditioning. Same thing with people walking by. What I like to do with dogs that are uncomfortable or they bark at people walking by, I go to an area where there's a good amount of traffic, but I go far enough away where my dog is not having any of those negative reactions or the dog that I'm working with is not having any of those negative reactions. Then I'm rewarding the dog, I'm training, I'm creating a strong positive association. Now, if you wanna stop the barking, so the reason why I went over all that is because you wanna make sure that these behaviors are not based on fear. If the behaviors are based on fear and you correct your dog, it could make the fear worse. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If it's not based on fear, then you could start teaching a quiet command. I talked about this on the last live Q&A that I did. Quiet command is very easy to teach if you do it this way. I've seen other techniques when it comes to teaching a quiet command online and they just are not as effective as a technique I'm about to say right now. Our no or our word that predicts a leash pop or a correction that's a conditioned punisher. It's what it's called, a conditioned punisher. It's been conditioned to predict a punishment. So if you say no, and then you correct your dog, no is a conditioned punisher, just like yes predicts a reward. So yes is a conditioned reinforcer. I treat the word quiet or the command quiet the same way that I do as a conditioned correction. I tell the dog quiet, once they bark, they bark, I go quiet, and I give them a correction. The moment they're quiet, good, nice job. So now you might be asking yourself, well, if this is the same as a condition correction, then why don't we just keep using the established no marker that we've been using as the condition correction? These two sounds are the same in the very beginning. However, once the dog starts to respond, to the quiet command, meaning you say quiet and your dog instantly goes quiet without you having to give your dog a correction. Now your dog knows the command and no longer needs the correction. So now it is a condition or it's no longer being treated as a condition correction. Now it's being treated as a command. The condition correction or no always predicts a correction. So that's going to be the difference between the two. A good example is what's the difference between the come command and a terminal marker? Because if you see me teaching the come command, I go come, and then I move back, I drop my hand down, I encourage the dog to come to me, I lift up, they sit, I use a marker and I reward the behavior. When I am teaching the terminal marker, I say free, and then I move back, I drop my hand down, encourage the dog to come to me to get the reward. The terminal marker always predicts the reward. Come is a command, they have to come and comply. And in the beginning, it always predicts a reward, just like we're teaching any new command. We always use continual reinforcement in the beginning until the dog knows the command, then we start to space out the rewards. All right, let's see what's next. Um, waking dog training, I'm not sure what that is. Question, already taught the dog multiple tricks. Sit down here, paw climb, off center, jump, heel spin, crawl, without markers. How to teach markers without breaking, damaging the relation with my dog? Uh, well, markers are, are, it depends on the type of marker that you are teaching. By definition, in order for a word or sound to be a marker, it must predict one of the four quadrants of opera conditioning, positive or negative reinforcement, positive or negative punishment. Teaching behaviors without markers is very possible because when we are teaching commands, we're right next to the dog. If I'm on step two of my training where I'm luring my dog into all the different positions, if I lift up to lure my dog into a sit and the dog's right in front of me, the moment the dog's butt hits the ground, I can give that dog a piece of food, connecting the behavior to the reward. Our markers really come in handy when we don't have the 
we don't have enough, or, or I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. The, mar the markers come in handy when we are unable to get the primary reinforcer to the, to the dog within a second of them doing the behavior we're trying to capture. If I'm luring a dog, it's very easy. But once I start giving a dog commands from a distance, now using markers become very valuable because I can't get the primary to the dog within a second of them doing the behavior anymore. Also, markers help us pinpoint very fine details within our training. Michael Ellis has a great example of this with the dog healing, looking up. If he just rewards the dog and the dog drops their head and gets the reward, he's rewarding the dog for doing the exact opposite behavior of what he actually wants. But if the dog is looking up at the handler and the handler marks, well, now we're marking the behavior of the dog looking at us. So markers do come in handy. now. To answer that question, I would just start with the engagement training. Doing the engagement training, it doesn't matter how much training the dog has had. Dogs love engagement training. It's fun. It's engaging. They're getting paid for almost doing nothing at all, simply looking up at us. Just make sure your timing is correct, and then you can start incorporating those markers into the training. And then doing step three in my manual or on my videos, which is teaching the dog leash pressure, which again should really be called a leash cue because we are teaching the dog to go with the pressure, not to resist. I like to use my leash pressure training as a marker as well. So I use the word wrong. So if I tell a dog that I'm training wrong, that means I'm gonna take the leash and I'm going to show them what I want them to do with the leash pressure cue we've already established. And it becomes very transferable because the more we use it, what it ends up meaning to the dog is stop what you're doing or go back to the previous position. Dog breaks the climb, wrong. We put the dog back on the climb. Dog breaks the down state, wrong. We put the dog back into the down state. The dog goes in an unrestricted, or sorry, the dog goes in a restricted room, wrong. We use a leash, we cue the dog out of the room. The dog jumps on a piece of furniture they're not supposed to be on, wrong. We use a leash to cue them off. So the wrong become a, it can become a very useful tool. It's also good to reinforce commands in the very beginning when the dog is still new to the training and if they choose not to do it. If you tell them to sit and they're like, ah, I don't feel like doing it right now and they don't realize that they have to, then you can say wrong, use a leash, cue the dog into the sit, good dog, so they start to understand and then you can transfer that over to correction in order to get reliability. How do I make my dog stop cleaning my kitchen? He's not very good at it, I just want him to stop now. I feel like, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, that would be really cool if you could teach your dog to clean your kitchen. Okay, rescue an abused dog, how best to socialize a pup who is afraid of his own shadow? All right, that is a tough one. Um, if you have a group or if you have somebody who perhaps, so uh, I'll give you an example. I would help dogs that had fear issues like that when I would have a bunch of dogs. So it used to be that I would have anywhere from 10 to 15 dogs on average at my house. And if I had six dogs I knew were really friendly, really sweet, bunch of puppies or something like that, it's going to be very easy to socialize that dog. Now the dog's gonna be afraid at the very beginning, but once the dog realizes that these dogs are not aggressive, they're not a threat, they do quickly come over that fear. I had a German Shepherd dog that I was training once. I went to the house to meet the dog, meet the owners, and the owners at the very beginning told me right away, like, oh, our dog is very protective. It was a young puppy. And once I saw the dog's behavior, I said, that's not protection, that's fear. Your dog is afraid. And when I took the dog back to the house, part of the socializing process with the training, I started letting out the dogs one by one. And these were all young, happy-go-lucky, very friendly dogs. And the German Shepherd that I was working with ran and hid in a corner and just sat there. The other dogs went up, investigated, sniffed them. And then by a day or two, she was completely fine being around these new dogs. It's about making sure we expose this dog to the right dogs. You don't wanna have a dog that is already fearful and then having a bad experience. And this is why I say this is a tough situation because if you don't have those types of resources or if you don't have enough friends that have friendly dogs, then it can become very difficult. You don't just wanna to go to a dog park and hope for the best. Dog parks can be risky. You can benefit from going to a dog park, but I just don't think the risk is, I think the risk outweighs the benefit, so I don't take dogs to dog parks. I mean, think about it. How many of you have been to a dog park where half the people there are playing on their phone or they're reading a book and they're not even paying attention to their dog? And then something happens and then they're surprised that something happened because they weren't paying attention, they weren't reading the dog's body language to make sure nothing would happen. So I don't like going to dog parks because it could be a risk. 
But if you can find, if you have friends, if you have family that have nice, friendly dogs, uh, puppies, that's going to help and you want to socialize the dog with them. An exercise that you can do, and I've talked about this quite a bit, to get the dog comfortable being around other dogs is going to a dog park but not going into the dog park. You probably already heard me say this before. Stay far enough away that you're not getting a terrible reaction. If you're too close, your dog might start responding with fear or barking or cowering. You want to be close enough that your dog can see what's going on, but far enough away that you're not getting a negative reaction. And then reward your dog, play with your dog, create a strong positive association. You could also, this is a, I've talked about this before. It's a really good example of how I worked with a very, very fearful dog. The dog was a very sweet dog, just incredibly fearful. Anytime you took this dog out in public, the dog would shut down and be on high alert, just looking around, worried about everything. And what I did was I first started working the dog in the backyard and then I started working the dog in the front yard. In the front yard, that was the only location that the dog was able to eat. Then a local park, that was the only location I would feed the dog. Then eventually I was taking the dog to Home Depot and it took a few days before the dog would even eat at Home Depot. I took the dog to Home Depot. I'm offering the dog food and the dog is ignoring the food because there's too much going around. And I also went on a day where there wasn't that much traffic. You wouldn't want to take a dog that's fearful or nervous or uncomfortable in public and take them to Home Depot on a Saturday morning when it's jam packed with people. That's going to be too much. So I went when there was less traffic at a different time, different times in the day when there's less traffic. And I gradually started to uh, increase, I guess you could say, the difficulty of the environment by going at times where it did become a little bit busier depending on the day, but starting when it wasn't that busy. And then I kept going when it wasn't busy until the dog was taking food from me and started to do training in that environment. So each time I was able to progress with the dog, I would make the environment a little bit more difficult. I do have a video on that generalizing and socializing a dog and has a good way of explaining what sort of commands and what things you want to ask for from your dog depending on the environment and depending on the dog's proficiency level within the training all right let's see what's next can i teach my future protection dog okay nope you can't do that are you going to make any more service dog videos? I probably will be. Right now, I'm just in a uh, difficult position for filming. As many of you know, just moved back to California from North Carolina. Since we've been back, this is the second Airbnb that I've been in. I might end up having to go to another Airbnb. Uh, I have a little one on the way. So there's a lot of things going on. Once everything is a little bit more established, then I'm gonna be doing more videos with new dogs. So I'm gonna be doing as many videos as I can based on the situation. So you'll probably start seeing a, uh, a more dogs or a larger variety of dogs in my videos once I'm established and set back up in the house out here and everything's kind of running smooth. Okay, uh, all day with my dogs and they did awesome. That's great, my pleasure. Uh, let's see, I'm teaching my pit bull to play center field. I've not seen you teach catch suggestions. Uh, catch, for a dog, it's just about practicing. Of course, if you're trying to use, you wanna use something that's easy for the dog to catch, but just practicing gives the dog the ability to understand. Like if you take a brand new dog or a puppy and you try to throw a piece of food at that dog, the dog's not going to catch it. They're, they just don't have the coordination for it yet. So it's just practicing it. It's the same with like teaching a dog Frisbee. When I teach dogs Frisbee, I like to use the, the light Frisbees, not the hard ones, the very light ones, the ones that are made out of fabric. And then I throw it with a really nice spin to slow down the speed of the Frisbee to give the dog a little bit more time to properly time it and catch it. But just practicing with them is what gets them to do these things. So like Frisbee isn't very hard to teach, it just takes time. It takes going out and giving the dog a lot of opportunities to develop the skill set and get good at it. And if the dog enjoys playing fetch, it becomes pretty simple. Same thing with throwing food at them. All right, let's see. What else do we have? If your dog is being aggressive due to resource guarding and you need to get what he has off him, how can you do this without being bit? All right, I would recommend watching the, the resource guarding episode that I did with Bethany. It's the same technique that I like to use, but you, you have to work with them 
just like anything, you have to work with the dog. You have to rehearse it. So then when a situation comes up, so like this, you said you need to get what he has away from him. Well, if I'm worried about the dog biting me, then I'm going to use leash pressure. I'm just going to use a leash. That way I can lift up. So if you've seen my video teaching a dog how to drop, there's a few ways we can teach a dog to drop an item. One is by using value transfer. You have two toys, exactly the same. The dog has one toy, you pull out the next toy. Hey, look what I have. The dog releases the old toy, bites the new toy, and you go into play. Once you know you can get the dog to drop the item every time you present the new item, then you put the command on it. So you would say, drop it. Then you bring the new toy out, the dog drops the old toy, and you reinforce and you play with the new toy. Then, once you know your dog will drop the video every time you say drop it, then you reward him with the same toy. So you have the toy, you tell him drop it or out, the dog releases, you can use your terminal marker and go right back into play. So we can teach with value transfer. Another great technique though is teaching with leash pressure. You tell the dog out, you lift up on the leash, the moment the dog drops the item in their mouth, you turn off the pressure. So that's what I would do if I needed to get something away from a dog. And I'm assuming by asking this question, you're talking about something that could be harmful or potentially dangerous to the dog that you have. Teaching a drop it really helps. Also getting them used to your hand coming towards them when they have a resource is going to help quite a bit as well. Like I said, watch the video that I did with Bethany. If you type Nate Schomer resource guarding, the video will come up and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. All right, I have a deaf dog. Okay, so if you're working with a deaf dog, then you can use different signals to communicate with them. Dogs are very good at body language. They're very good at scent or they're very good at reading body language. And they obviously have a, a really good nose, much better than ours. I've worked with a few deaf dogs before and what I do for that is pretty much the same thing I do with any other dog. Now, I worked with another trainer that had a deaf dog and when she would mark behaviors, she would do a thumbs up. So the dog would do it, she would do thumbs up and then she would give the dog a reward. I tried it, it seemed to help a little bit. But another thing is dogs that, at least from my experience, the few that I've worked with, they end up being more focused and more aware with their nose and their eyes since their hearing doesn't work. So they look at us a lot more. And when they do that, they're able to pick up on our body language when we're going to reward them. So something that's important to understand when it comes to rewarding a dog or connecting a behavior to the reward, all we have to do is make sure that the dog knows that the reward is coming to them. Once they know that the reward's coming to them, then they made the connection. So if I ask a dog to sit, and the moment the dog sits and I start walking towards them and they know me walking towards them as I'm reaching for the treat means I'm going to reward them. Once they connect that action as it predicting the reward, then they made the connection. They know sitting got you to walk towards me and reach into your bait bag, which means you're going to give me a reward. So connecting behavior with reward, the dog just has to know that the reward is coming. Of course, markers help us with that because our dogs are not always looking at us. Now, another thing that I would use with uh, deaf dogs is I would get a remote training collar and I would use the vibrate. So the vibrate I would use as a pay attention to me or a come when called. So. Pretty much most remote training, not most, but a lot of remote training collars come with a vibrate option. And that's a great option for training a deaf dog because you can get their attention with it. It's not a correction. And of course you can use the, the stem to correct as well. You have to make sure you teach them to be directional before you do that. So there's a lot of different pieces when we put this together, but that's going to help quite a bit as well. All right, let's see what's next. Uh, okay, so I'm a member, but maybe I got the question in too late because you didn't mention it. It's a ninth, ninth comment at the top of the members post. Okay, let me look real quick to see what it is. Okay. All right, let's see. Here we go. I have a question today about recreate training. I'm at the stage where I fumble keys, leave, lock the door, then come back and treat if she's good. Okay, so you're getting the dog used to being comfortable with the crate. I do that five times and can leave for 20. I wanna keep ending on a good note and building up alone skills. 
I'm currently watching full time on the camera while I'm away. Please describe the steps as you've seen it for extending this time every day at 10 minutes, or can I add bigger or smaller chunks follow up with the question. So one of the best ways when, when you guys are asking questions, the shorter, the better. So sometimes the questions are so long that just getting through it takes a few minutes. Uh, okay, follow up question. After being able to be alone in the crate for hours at a time, when would you know that you can begin testing staying at home alone without the crate? Okay, so I think you're asking about getting the dog comfortable being in the crate and then leaving the dog home alone without being in the crate. I don't leave a dog home alone in, in the house until I know that they're good while I'm there. So if you're still having to, so like, let's think about what's house training and what's potty training. Well, we use a crate for those two reasons, for potty training and house training. Dogs don't like to go to the bathroom where they eat or where they sleep. That's why we put them in a crate that's just big enough for them to stand up, turn around and lay down. Well, what's house training? Well, house training is a dog knowing how to properly behave within the house. So not getting into the trash, not drinking out of the toilet bowl, not chewing up furniture or ripping up carpet. These are things we don't want our dogs to do. If you're having to still reinforce expectations while you're at the house, then your dog certainly is not ready to be left at the house when you're not there. Now using something like a Furbo camera definitely does help. And Furbo is great. I have a video on it. I like the Furbo, I use it. That's going to help you at least watch when they're not there. But even when I'm training a dog and I'm leaving the house and I wanna make sure that they're okay when I'm not there, I'll have the Furbo set up or a baby cam, whatever you want to be able to see. You can even FaceTime another phone. I act like I'm leaving and then I watch the dogs to make sure they're not doing anything that I don't want them to do. A good way to build up to this is by doing commanded stays while you're not in the room. So placing your dog on a down, uh, let's say a climb stay is a good one. It's a very easy command. You put the dog on the climb stay, you make sure the camera is facing the dog. You leave the moment your dog breaks the climb stay, you walk in, no, or wherever you are in the training, and you reinforce the rules and the expectations. Then you leave again. So now the dog is starting to understand because by setting the dog up, in a sense, what we're doing here is we're setting the dog up to fail. Most dogs, even if they have a really solid stay command, the moment we leave the room, they go, I don't have to do this anymore. And they break the position. So we're setting them up to fail. We're showing them, look, when I'm not here, if I walk out of the room, I'm still watching you. So when the dog breaks it, again, we go in and we reinforce it. And we do that enough times to where we can leave and we can sit outside for 15, 20, 30 minutes and the dog stays on the climb that entire time. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, that seems like a very long time. It may seem like a long time. Grab a book, watch a YouTube video, do something. It's not that difficult to pass 20 minutes. And then the crate, it's just duration. If the dog is making noise in the crate, I talked about this before, we start by putting a blanket over it. If the blanket doesn't work, the bowl technique works very nice and we can teach them to be quiet. When I start giving a dog more freedom inside of the house as well, I start with sections of the house. So we don't give them the entire full access of the house. Maybe the dog will stay in where their crate is just in that room, but now they're not in the crate. They can go in and out of the crate and hang out in the rest of the room. If the dog is good with that short time window, we can increase the time and then we can start adding more rooms for the dog to have access to or the living room, the kitchen, whatever works, but we want to gradually build it up. All right, let's see what's next. Okay, I have a seven month German Shepherd Husky Lab. He eats his poo occasionally, any suggestions? If you have a dog that has, if we look at behavioral issues, and you probably already know what the five are, aggressive, fearful, destructive, dangerous, or behaviors we don't want the dog to perform. This falls under dangerous, I would say. I don't think, I mean, dogs can handle eating their own feces, but it's definitely not good for them. Their stomachs are way more resilient than ours are, but nonetheless, that could cause issues. We don't want them to do it. It's obviously not sanitary. I correct it right away. Now, I have remote training collars, so I would use a remote training collar. I'd put the collar on the dog. I'd send them in the yard where I know the dog's gonna go try to eat some poo. The moment the dog does that, I'm gonna stimulate the collar. And then I get to be the good guy. I go, what happened, buddy? 
did that poo bite you? Probably shouldn't be doing that. And now the dog has a negative association to doing that behavior that we don't want the dog to perform. If you don't have a remote collar, then you want to correct it. So that's a behavior I'm going to correct right away because it falls under the potentially dangerous behavior. And we don't want our dogs practicing any behaviors that could be dangerous. Uh, let's see. After listening to you talk about wrong, am I in the wrong? My German Shepherd understands not very well. I also been using it after giving a command that he ignores. I use, so the, the marker wrong that predicts leash pressure, I use it when I first start teaching a stay. So these are all the different examples or different situations in which I'll use wrong, which is my predictor for negative reinforcement. Now, more often than not, when I'm using negative reinforcement on a dog, it's with leash pressure, but there are different forms of negative reinforcement. In fact, if your dog breaks a stay and you start walking towards your dog, your dog goes oh and goes back onto the stay position that in a sense was negative reinforcement you walking towards the dog was the pressure the moment the dog complied you turned the pressure off by backing away so i use wrong as a predictor for negative reinforcement again more often than not it's going to be leash pressure so i use it when i'm teaching the stay i'll use it when i'm creating boundaries whether it's invisible boundaries going into a room i don't want the dog to go into jumping up on furniture that I don't want the dog to jump up on, jumping up on people, maybe jumping out of the car door before I release the dog, which that would in a sense fall under the stay. And then also when I first start giving dogs the command without the help of the physical cue, I might reinforce with leash pressure if the dog needs it. When I'm teaching a dog command, when we're looking at obedience, we have two issues that fall under obedience, a dog not doing something we asked them to do and a dog not staying in a stay. I continue to use the leash pressure on the stay until I know the dog knows the stay. When I know the dog knows the stay, or at least I believe the dog knows the stay based on their body language when I'm doing the exercise or when I say wrong, they quickly go back to the stay. Then I transfer over to the no. So the no predicts positive punishment. So after I've taught the dog the command and position and I know they know the stay from the leash pressure, then I transfer it over with the leash pop. So then the next time the dog breaks a stay, instead of saying wrong, I say no, I give the dog a correction, I recommand what I want the dog to do, and then I assist them with the leash if needed. So it's always no, correction, recommand, assist. That makes it easy. If I always know when I start using no, it's no correction, recommand, assist, then I always know what to do. And I don't start that until I know the dog knows it. With commands, once I start giving the dog the commands and they're doing it without the help of the physical cue, so I say down and the dog lays down without me having to lure or without me having to use the leash pressure, I want the dog to be roughly at about an 80% success rate before I start correcting. And I also want to see that the dog is trying to do what I'm asking them to do. Me personally, I never correct for mistakes. Now I'm not going to reward a dog if they're not doing what I'm asking them to do. And if I notice they keep doing the wrong thing over and over again, then I'm going to assist with leash pressure. I'm going to make sure they do it right. A good example would be you're telling your dog to sit and instead of sitting, your dog is spinning or your dog is going in the center, your dog is doing the behavior, a different behavior than what you're asking them to perform. I'm not going to reward them for doing it. Now, I'm also not going to correct them. We have two options. We can use a non-reinforcement marker. So that's a word or sound that lets the dog know they did not do the behavior correctly, but you're going to recommand and give them another opportunity. Or we can say nothing at all. So you say sit and the dog spins. You just look at the dog sit the dog sits and then we reward the dog if i say sit and the dog spins again okay the dog needs help sit and i'm going to use the leash and the reason why i say i'm going to use a leash because that's going to prevent them from just spinning and not paying attention to what i'm asking them to do I'm trying to see where else i was going with that okay so we give the command um and you don't want to reward it again, like I was saying, because if you give a command and the dog does something different and we reward him. So something that also comes up with this is people say, well, I thought you said not to recommand something. When we're looking at commands, something has to take place after the command in order for us to recommand. So what I mean by that is if you say sit and your dog does a spin, well, something happened. 
It was the incorrect behavior, but something happened. Now, what you wouldn't want is you wouldn't want to say sit, and the dog looks at you and goes, I'm not doing it. Now, nothing has happened. The dog didn't attempt to do it. We didn't say wrong. We didn't say no. So you wouldn't want to say sit again in that situation. You would sit, 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 sit. You wouldn't want to do that. So if you say sit and the dog does nothing, you can say wrong and you can use the leash and you can make the dog sit. Or you can say no, correction, sit, and then assist them if needed. I like to use the corrections, as I said, once the dog is at about an 80% 80 success rate. Okay, let's see. What else we have? Uh, Thanks, BK. I appreciate that. Glad to know you're back. Would love to meet up and do some training for sure. Practice. Yep, practice. How do I teach my 17-month-old German Shepherd dog to entertain herself while I work from home? That's that's going to be depending on the dog. You know, um, my dog, for example, Ari, she likes to suckle on her blanket, and that keeps her entertained. You can, they have these different puzzles that you can do. So they have puzzles for dogs, bones, bully sticks. It, that, that's, I mean, a tough question. A lot of times dogs will learn to entertain themselves. And if they don't learn how to entertain themselves, then you could try to give them different things. So I would just do some research on Google and see what sort of things you can get that could possibly provide some sort of entertainment for your dog. Okay, let's see what else we have. Uh, thanks again, BK. Awesome videos as always. Love these new live Q and A's. I hope these live Q and A's are helpful. I enjoy doing them. I love talking dogs. Is there a big dog breed that is not so energetic that one needs to be taken for super long walks yet can handle tropical climate and hopefully can serve as a guard dog? How big are you thinking? I mean, most dogs can handle different climates as long as they have a place to cool down if needed. When looking at our dogs, a good indicator of if they're too hot or too tired is the size of their tongue. So whatever dog you are looking into, I would be more concerned about finding a dog that's going to fit the specific needs that I want that dog for. Less active, large dog. And that also comes down to the individual dog. Uh, a Doberman is obviously going to be way more active than a St. Bernard might be or a Newfoundland, although Newfoundlands can be pretty active too. They were used as rescue dogs for a long time and they would actually pull in boats. There's some really cool history on the Newfoundland. Uh, let's see. Why don't you show examples of positive punishment in your vi videos? Not many freely available examples from good trainers, different levels for different dogs in the content context of obedience or quiet cue. That's a good question and it is something I'm going to be doing, but it's only going to be available for channel members. As I said, I'm, I'm in this situation where I'm moving around. I'm trying to get reestablished and set back up here in California. And that's going to come once I start doing stay in trains again. I'm going to start doing stay in trains, hopefully by like November, maybe December timeframe. And when I start doing those stay in trains, I'm going to show the entire process, including corrections. So flat collar correction, prong collar corrections, remote training collar corrections. So you can see how to do it the right way and how we can get a dog to that desired off leash status. But uh, again, that's only going to be available for channel members. And the reason why is, as you already know, the internet can be a very hostile place. So I'm not going to be giving people ammunition, but for those that are serious and they're willing to pay the $1.99 a month member fee, it's going to be available for channel members. Like I said, hopefully by November. Uh, what's your opinion on impact dog crates? They seem pretty good. Uh, a few of my friends have used them. I haven't used any of them, but they do seem like pretty good crates. My six month old Shevsky boy says, thank you for your videos. Uh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. Do you do agility training? I went down the crux agility competition rabbit hole and it was awesome. I have not competed in agility. I've probably trained around eight dogs to do agility. I have some agility videos. 
Agility, if your dog enjoys doing agility, agility is one of those things that is very easy to teach a dog, but it's very difficult to compete at a high level. And I say that because I don't want to discredit agility competition trainers because winning at the world level for agility is by no means an easy or simple accomplishment. That is something very difficult to do because it's being able to get your dog to not only, of course, be able to do all the obstacles, but do it with speed and precision and be able to beat everyone else. So uh, competing at the top level is very difficult. Dogs love it. So I think agility is something really great. It's something, it's a good thing to do to bond with a dog. So if you have a local facility that offers agility training, you'd probably enjoy it. And so would your dog. Uh, your dog got fixed three days ago. When is it okay to start walking with him again? Something like that, I would uh, ask your veterinarian. See what they say. Usually it's like one week or two weeks. I use the word wrong with my dog to keep her out of her room when she is not allowed in. She's doing great. Okay, that's awesome. My pleasure. When are you getting Bethany on these videos? Uh, we'll be doing some more videos with Bethany, hopefully within the next month or so. I've been talking with her and since I'm back in California, in fact, I talked with her a couple days ago through text message. So we're gonna be doing some more training with uh, Bethany and her team here real soon. Bethany is awesome. If you haven't seen her videos, definitely check them out on my channel. If you just type Nate Schoen or Bethany, all her videos sh should come up and she is quite the exceptional trainer. Any tips on how to address when my dog is being aggressive towards others? Is pulling back on the leash bad? Is blocking line of sight good? Is trying to turn my dog around good? Uh, what I do if my dog starts to act aggressive, which Ari will do it on occasions, she'll get an attitude and I'll correct her. I'll remind her, no, that's not an okay behavior. And remember when we're using corrections, the corrections have to be adequate to the dog's bank account as well as the environment. What I mean by that is some dogs need higher corrections. Some dogs are okay with a lower correction, it's going to depend on the dog's correction level. Some dogs need a correction, let's say a 25 on a remote collar, zero to 100 is gonna be more than enough, while other dogs might need a 35, some dogs are okay on a, a five, 10. Depends again on the dog, but I would correct that behavior. Pulling back on the leash can sometimes create more frustration, but often we may have to do that just to prevent the dog from doing something we don't want. Blocking the line of sight, I'll do that. I'll block the line of sight, that's not a bad option. And trying to turn your dog around, that could be fine as well. But a lot of times I want to stop that behavior before it progresses and I'll use a correction. All right, let's see. So you have the, the spin. Yeah, that's a very common one. I have the spin instead of the sit type problem also. That happens, dogs enjoy the spin command most dogs don't care for the sit. The sit's boring. There's nothing fun about it. So they hear that S and they go, spin. That's what I'm doing. Sometimes it can help using a different command instead of the word spin, just because spin and sit can sound so similar to one another. Tips to help dogs from confusing sit with down and vice versa. Do you offer down with a one week stay and train? So with my stay and trains, I used to do two weeks minimum when I start the stay in trains again, I'm probably going to be doing either three or four week stay in trains and I'm only going to, going to be doing one dog at a time since I have a lot going on. Plus, when I started to have more than five dogs within a stay in train, and this was when I wasn't doing YouTube as often, which YouTube does take a good amount of time, five was almost becoming too much. The more dogs you have, if you're training dogs, the quality starts to go down. So I'm gonna be doing one dog at a time. And in a stay and train, I teach sit, down, come, heel, spin, center, climb, off, stay in all the commanded positions, as well as if requested, I do remote collar training as well. So after two weeks to a month, depending on what I'm doing, the dog will be off leash trained with the remote training collar and we'll know sit down well, spin i teach the dog spin but that's not part of the the guarantee more of the the obedience the basic obedience but i teach every dog spin and center just because it's fun and it makes the training more engaging and interesting for the dog 
All right, let's see what else we have. How do you feel the best way to transport a dog in a vehicle? I like to transport them in a crate or if you have an, an area that's separated from the humans and the dogs. So for example, the back of my vehicle, I have one of those separators that separate my dogs from the rest of the vehicle. So they're back there, they're fine. A crate is really good. If they're gonna be in the back seat and they're not in a crate, then you should have some way to buckle them in. So they have harnesses that you can hook to a buckle and buckle the dog in so they're safe and they're not gonna bounce around if you do happen to get into a fender bender or an accident. How do you approach training a, uh, let me see, four month old? Okay, so you're, you're looking at a Dogo, um, four month, okay. So dogs like to pull do hard weighted tasks and pull more muscle. So you're trying to develop the muscle. You want to get your dog to start pulling more. Dogs pull naturally. So if you do reward them for pulling, they're going to continue to pull. I haven't specifically done that type of training. I have friends that have, and it really is just comes down to rewarding them for pulling. And as I said, dogs naturally pull. They have that classical opposition reflex. So we pull on the leash, they pull in the opposite direction. So instead of teaching leash pressure, you teach them to, to pull and you reward that behavior. Of course, if you're gonna have the dog pull, you wanna make sure you have on a really good harness. There are companies that make harnesses for sled dogs. That would be the type of harness that I would recommend for pulling. They are uh, custom made for each dog so it would fit your dog perfectly. You set in the measurements because you don't want a dog pulling on a cheap harness, something that's not going to distribute the weight properly across the dog's chest and shoulders. So I don't remember the name of the company, but there is a company, as I said, that makes harnesses for sled dogs and that's probably going to be the best for something like that. Do you think it's a bad idea to have a dog that can physically overpower you, even if you're a good dog trainer with a lot of knowledge on dog behavior? So if you're talking about, let's say you're a professional dog trainer and you're going to take in a dog to train that could overpower you, I would only be concerned about that if the dog was aggressive. Working with aggressive dogs can be very stressful. Some people like it. I've never been a fan of working with uh, aggressive dogs, but more often than not, it's fear aggression. So once you develop a relationship with the dog, a lot of those aggressive issues go away, especially when we can communicate with them more clearly. A lot of times, like if you go on YouTube and you type Frankie the Demon Dog, Nate Schomer, this was a bull terrier that, they said it was this demon dog. It, it was on Inside Edition. This dog was horrible, aggressive, would, would attack the cameraman and everything. And I had the dog for, I think, two or three weeks, something like that. And the dog was just mis misunderstood. The dog didn't know what was right, what was wrong. And after working with the dog for a little bit, the dog was fine. So most aggression stems from fear. It can stem from confusion. It could also be a, a form of bluffing. But when we're dealing with a real, true, aggressive dog, which there's not that many out there, then I would be really hesitant with wanting to, I, I wouldn't want to be alone. Let me put it this way. I wouldn't want to be alone with a dog that was dominant, aggressive, or forward aggressive dog, and I knew the dog can overpower me. That's going to be a scary situation to be in. And if you're afraid, as many of you already know, the dog's going to pick up on that and it's gonna make the situation even worse. So don't put yourself in a situation that you're not comfortable or confident with. Dogs that I've worked with that were very aggressive dogs, and I was concerned about possibly being bit, I would wear my bite suit that I used for protection training. I put my bite suit on and I'd start training the dog. So if the dog did bite me, it wasn't going to hurt, and I was confident because I knew I had the protection gear on. Uh, but yeah, don't put yourself in a situation where you're afraid and you're worried about being overpowered by a large dog. Okay, where was I? If you haven't seen the dog dance competition, you should look into it. Very high level, of course. Yeah, that's cool. 
Yeah, I definitely agree. Those of you that are watching, pull up those dog dance competitions. They're really fun, and you can tell the dogs are having a blast. It's really just a lot of tricks that they've taught the dog, but they've done it in a way where the handler and the dog, are they're literally doing a dance. It's really, really cool. Do puppies' attention span typically grow as they do, or is it just the dog? Can you help them want to learn longer somehow? So yes, a dog's attention span will increase as they get older. If you look at, for example, French ring competition obedience, French ring level three, a dog can be on the field for 45 minutes. And you may think to yourself, 45 minutes, that is a long time. But the dogs have gone over that routine so many times they know it. So it's not like they're learning something new. When a dog is learning something new, the duration in which you can train them is much shorter than having a dog doing something they already know for a longer period of time. But just like with people, the duration, the attention span will increase as the dog becomes more proficient and confident within the training. Just always make sure if you're teaching your dog something new that you keep the sessions short, fun, engaging. So this way when you stop, the dog is excited to come back for the next session and then they're gonna be able to learn that much better. I have a six month old, uh, where were we? I have a six month old male Labrador that has a habit of nipping, jumping, overall spoiled, rotten. What advice do you offer to stop this? So something like that, if I got a six month old Labrador retriever, sounds like just a happy-go-lucky, playful dog. Just because a dog is mouthing or biting, that's a form of play, it's a form of wrestling, socializing, and a lot of dogs enjoy that type of behavior. That dog comes in for training and the owner tells me, I don't want the dog to jump and bite like this anymore. Can you fix that? Of course, I'm just gonna do obedience. I'm gonna go through the process. I'm going to do the engagement training so I can communicate clearly, teach that continuation terminal marker. I'm gonna use the lure to teach the dog what behaviors I want him or her to perform. I'm going to, I was trying to see if there was a male or female, male, okay. I'm going to teach the dog leash pressure so I can control the dog when they're doing things that I don't want. I'm gonna implement the commands, develop reliability, work on the stay. So I'm going to do obedience. This way I can clearly communicate what I want. If I had all that stuff already done and the dog's doing that behavior, so the dog starts to nip, I, I'm either going to use wrong and I'm gonna stop the dog with leash pressure or I'm gonna correct the dog with a no and a leash pop. Jumping, same thing, dog jumps, wrong, I'm gonna use the leash pressure. If the dog is beyond that, I'm gonna use a no and I'm gonna correct the dog. Just remember, the, the leash pressure gives us the opportunity to teach the dog the rules and expectations without having to correct them. I don't like to correct a dog unless I'm pretty confident they know the rules, they know what's expected, they know how to turn off pressure by complying, and we've given them a very clear path to success. Now, as I mentioned before, I will correct day one dangerous behaviors. I will correct destructive behaviors right away. But we always want to make sure the dog knows the rules before we start correcting them. All right. Thanks for the tips. Yeah, mine has randomly decided recently that he hates French bulldogs, and I haven't been sure how to discourage his talk racism. That's funny. Uh, hopefully, the advice, the, um, advice helps. She heals great for treats and barely at all when I don't have treats. How do I bridge the gap? Okay, so what I would recommend if you're having issues where your dog is performing really well when you have rewards, but not when you don't have rewards, watch the episode that I posted on training without treats. It wasn't, I, I'll just put it in the, the comments real quick. So this is something that comes up quite often. People wanna know because in my videos, I'm using treats throughout the video. And that's because when we're teaching a new behavior, we're doing continual reinforcement. We're rewarding the correct repetition of every single behavior. All right, so let me see. Where is training without treats? There we go. So follow this process, and you should be able to get to a point where you can get the dog to perform the behavior without having to give treats the entire time. In addition to that, corrections help as well. But I want to make sure, remember, in order for our dogs to do something, they have to either, so like we ask a dog to do something, well, why is the dog doing the behavior? We have to think about motivation. Motivation determines our dog's behaviors. If we look at it in the most simplified manner, 
Access something pleasant, prevent something unpleasant. So if the dog is doing something we're asking them to perform, either A, they're doing it because they enjoy being around us, they enjoy working with us, which is a possibility, usually more common for our Labrador Retriever type dogs. Or they're doing it for the possibility of receiving a reward or they're doing it to prevent the possibility of receiving a correction. And if none of those are there, the dog will not do the behavior. So we have to make sure we're influencing our dog's behaviors by implementing the right motivating factors that are going to contribute to the dog that we want. All right, let's see. Do you include protection dogs as one of those aggressive dogs one should not have if they can overpower you? Uh, protection dogs, it, it really depends on how the protection dog was trained. So most sport protection dogs are, I, actually I don't want to say most because there's a lot of protection dogs out there, sport protection dogs, and I've probably met around between 50 to 100. So my frame of reference in comparison to how many people actually train protection sport dogs is rather small if we're looking at it that way but from my experience most of the protection dogs that i've been around with and i've had the opportunity to work with and catch on a bite suit they've been very friendly dogs because the dogs were trained on um prey drive so they were never put into defense they were taught prey drive meaning when i came out with the bite suit on or the bite sleeve I was wearing the dog's toy. So the dog wasn't aggressive. The dog was taught how to do protection type exercises, but the dog wasn't an aggressive dog. So I usually wouldn't include protection as an aggressive dog. An aggressive dog usually falls under either, either fear aggression, dominant aggression, forward aggression, and more often than not, you're not going to um, run into very rarely are we going to run into dominant aggressive dogs i've only come across a couple since i've been training dogs professionally uh sorry it's just i like big dog breeds yet i'm five six and not a lot of muscle yeah i mean five six still isn't bad for being a dog trainer i've worked with plenty of dog trainers that were shorter than that and were able to get control the more experience you have and the more dogs you work with the easier it's going to be my biggest recommendation if if you're around a dog that you're afraid of that's going to have an impact on your training so either find a way to not be afraid of the dog or don't work with that type of dog Okay, any tips on becoming a dog trainer? Yes, I talked about that at the very beginning of the video. I have my first uh, dog accidentally was a working line German Shepherd. It's been fun watching him learn. Would love to get into the dog training world. Uh, so yeah, if you're if you're in the States, there's different dog training schools you can go to. There's also Star Mark Academy besides Tom Rose School and uh, Kennelwood. You have Learberg Online University. They have some good online courses. One of my biggest recommendations, because not everyone can afford a dog trainer school, not everyone can leave their profession, their career to go learn a new skill. Find a mentor, join a club. Joining obedience or protection clubs is a great way to learn how to become a dog trainer. Yep, keeping the sessions short, absolutely, and keeping them positive and ending on a positive note. Absolutely correct, BK. Uh, what do you think about pit bulls? Just like any dog breed out there, there are really amazing dogs in every single dog breed, and there are some that can be issues. Pit bulls are no different. I've worked with some of the most amazing pit bulls you'll ever meet in your entire life, and I've worked with pit bulls that were convicted murderers, meaning they've killed another dog. I've worked with huskies that were incredibly fun to work with. I've worked with huskies that were so stubborn and independent that they were no fun to work with. So I look at dogs more so as an individual. Now with something like powerful dog breeds, I think somebody should be well educated. I think the person should know how to handle the dog. I don't think anyone should get a large or powerful dog breed without being well educated, without knowing how to handle the dog and to properly take care of and raise the dog and keep the dog safe, happy and healthy. It's easier to get away with having a small dog if you don't know much about dog training because there's less risks. But a very large dog should be taken seriously regardless of the breed. Okay. 
Uh, do you ever need to think about a dog's teeth health? Health? Yes, in fact, I was gonna do a video on it before. So there's a local place out here in LA. I don't remember, they, okay, let me rephrase that. They're not really, they're local, but they go to different facilities. So one of them, if you're in the Los Angeles area, blue collar working dog, that's where I found out about them and they clean the dog's teeth. So you do it annually. I like to give my dogs raw dog bones with raw meat on it. That will help clean their teeth. There's also different products out there like Brightbox, for example. I've never used them. I'm aware of them because they reached out to me before, but they have uh, this way to keep your dog's teeth clean. I've used those honeycombs. I had it in one of my videos. I think they're called honeycomb, but yeah, keeping your dog's teeth and gums healthy is definitely important. Often feeding a dog's or feeding your dog a raw diet helps keep them clean, but raw bones and then, like I said, there's certain products out there that help brushing your dog's teeth as well is really good. Okay, awesome. I think that's a good session for today. Hopefully, we'll be doing another one soon. I have to get ready. I have a lesson coming up. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks for taking part, for socializing, socializing, for sharing the videos and commenting and being a part of everything. It's been awesome. I appreciate it. Looking forward to the next one. And I see more comments popping up. I'll have to answer those another time, but thanks again. Really appreciate everyone. Have a great weekend.